Okay, we have some people here. Okay, um, maybe it's about time to get started. We are uh, do you all have any questions uh, before I get started? No questions then, okay. Let me share my screen. Uh, Jen Liu, did you send me an email that I have not answered yet? Uh, no. No, okay. So I don't have any pending email from you that I need to answer. Okay, good. Um, well, today's lecture is going to be a bit different uh, because I'm not going to show lots of equations, but more discussing on the physical insight of things so that uh, you can understand antennas and how they work heuristically. Okay, so we're going to talk about different types of maintainers today. And the, the real fact is that um, many maintainers are designed using heuristics. because Maxwell's equations are too complicated. And one way to understand how things work is actually to solve closed form solution. When we solve closed form solutions, we obtain physical insight into how things work. Because we have gained physical insight, then um, we actually can come up with new designs uh, without having to solve those problems, okay? So in the beginning, we, we have closed form solutions that actually drive us to understand many things, like examples of closed form solutions are plane waves, uh, then we have uh, transmission lines, And then we have a wave guys. And then we have a case of a Hertzian dipole. Where essentially solutions can be obtained exactly using mathematical formula. But many problems are not solvable by closed form techniques. So we have to resort to approximate solutions. So you can see this very much in circuit theory. Like if you want to estimate the value of an inductor, or if you want to estimate the value of a capacitor, we use approximate formulas uh, to estimate the value of an inductor or the value of a capacitor. And if you're talking about antenna design, uh, if you want to do far field approximation, we essentially are using approximate techniques. Okay. So, so what happens then is that the art of numerical sim simulation or numerical solution have allowed us to solve Maxwell's equations as exactly as we want to be. And this area is known as computational electromagnetics. What you try to do then is to actually 
solve Maxwell's equations, you have curl of H is dd dt plus j. And then you have um, things like curl of E is equal to minus db dt. And you can further show that the divergence of D equals rho divergence of B equal to zero. And you try to write the computer code to solve this problem. And that area of study is known as computational electromagnetics. The wonderful thing about computational electromagnetics is that most people do not have to study the difficult math and physics to write the codes. Okay, you have to do quite a bit of math and physics in order to solve these PDEs. They're not easy to solve. And once they are solved, uh, the solutions or the method of solutions can be converted into a computer software. And you can run those computer software uh, to get the solutions that you want. And then uh, you can actually solve a lot of problems that way. Uh, some very uh, good examples of uh, computational electromagnetic software are produced by companies like ANSYS. And then you will have a company called CST, FICO, and soft. And the essentially, uh, companies specializing in producing uh, software to solve problems. But in the uh, in the EDA area, which stands for uh, electrical design. and automation. Okay. Uh, you will have companies like, um, let me write in another slide. Okay, you will have companies like uh, Synopsis, Cadence, Mentor, and Siemens. Actually, Mentor, Mentor got bought by Siemens. So Siemens now owns uh, Mentor. And this company specializes in producing software that can solve highly complicated uh, computer chip, computer design pro problem. There's an area called IC design, which stands for uh, integrated circuit design. And most of the time, uh, circuit design is very complicated. You don't have closed form solution. However, you can run computer software to solve many of the problems that you encounter in circuit design, okay? So let's start with some very simple example uh, of using physical insight to understand things. Okay, and we'll try to use that as much as possible. And if you have doubt, then you go to running computer software. Okay, and this area is usually called uh, virtual prototyping. And once you have done the design using computer software, uh, then only you are confident of building a more expensive uh, mock-up, okay? You build a mock-up to test if your ideas work. Um, that can uh, give rise to a lot of cost savings. Lots of cost savings and also uh, reduction of cut and try engineering. Okay. 
<coughs> cut and try engineering is very expensive in the lab, which means that you try a concept, you go to the lab, test it out, it doesn't work, and then you alter the design, and then you go to the lab and test it out again. But now this cycle, this cycle of cut and try engineering, okay, can be done on a computer, greatly reducing the cost. So let's get some feeling of heuristical understanding of things. So like if you have a half wave dipole, which you have not studied in great detail, but what we have studied is actually a short dipole, a very short dipole. We say that if you were hertz, you are clever enough to put in two spheres at the two ends so that you can drive a current to this short wave dipole. And because you can drive a current, uh, this thing would radiate. And so you can think of this as being almost equivalent to an inductor in series with a capacitor. Okay, because the lead of the antenna is like an inductor. And then the sphere is like a capacitor. Okay, but it is very hard to drive something into a short dipole. This is the case of a short dipole because it's essentially is an open circuit structure. And if the capacitance is very large, the inductance very small, you essentially have an open circuit to drive things. However, if you make the dipole longer, then it's easier to drive a current into this half wave dipole as you have shown here. The length of this dipole is made such that the length of the whole structure is about half a wavelength. And you can think of the half wave dipole as being a morphing of a transmission line uh, model. You can have a quarter wave transmission line. And if you gradually let the ends of the transmission line becoming further and further apart, and finally, when it becomes straight, uh, it essentially behaves like a half wave dipole. The wonderful thing is that on the transmission line, as we have studied, the wave is being guided along as it propagates on the line. But even when you flare up the two transmission lines, the wave is still being guided. And surprisingly, if you make the wave straight like what you had before, and if you do computer simulations, you see that there's actually a wave that is traveling from this end to that end very much like you see a wave traveling inside a transmission line. And that essentially what causes this dipole to radiate, okay? And then you have this uh, Yagi Uda antenna. Uh, Yagi Uda antenna um, is actually invented around 1926, I believe, yeah. And they actually did this invention based on physical intuition alone, uh, which is amazing because they didn't have computer simulation software then. What they found was that uh, if you have a dipole and if you put an array of dipole in front of it, slightly less than half a wavelength, okay, this become a waveguide. So this array of dipoles become like a waveguide. And if there's any radiation from this uh, driver dipole, this is a driver dipole that drives the whole system, the wave will tend to go in that direction. However, if you have a half wave dipole at the back that is slightly larger than half a wavelength, you find that it does not guide the wave anymore. In fact, it becomes a reflector. Okay, whereas this becomes a waveguide. The reason is because if you have a half wave dipole, when you send a wave in, the wave would be scattered in the forward and the backward direction. Okay, there will be induced currents. 
on this dipole, some of which would radiate in the forward direction and some of which would radiate in the backward direction. And if you change the length of the dipole, then you will find that the scattered wave in the forward direction can be in phase with the incident wave and hence add constructively. However, if you were to make the dipole too long, you'll find that the scattered wave in the forward direction is out of phase with the incident wave and hence it will cancel uh, destructively and hence most of the wave will go in the backward or the forward direction depending on the length of the dipole and depending on the phase of the wave as it propagates. And this dipole that we have here is called a folded dipole. Okay, I would not uh, explain the reason here, but the folded dipole has about four times the impedance of a half wave dipole. And if you have a half wave dipole, the impedance is around uh, 70 ohms. Okay, this is uh, the radiation resistance is about 70 ohms. And that has been done uh, by a lot of people. It's a very difficult calculation to do. In a sense, you did a very simple version in your homework, but that is not a kosher version. Uh, to do it correctly, you have to account for phase retardation and time retardation and so on. Uh, if you do it correctly, the radiation resistance of this dipole is about that, okay? So it has a four times the impedance of a half wave dipole, which puts it around 300 ohms. Because the impedance is uh, around 300 ohms, then they are a kind of, um, transmission lines that is very popular at that time, which has an impedance of around 300 ohms. So this dipole was very popular then. Okay, this I think is called twin X. Okay, it essentially consists of uh, two transmission lines uh, held together by a plastic strip. And then you can use this uh, to carry signals. It was very popular long ago when TV uh, was very popular and it was operating at a lower frequency. But nowadays, people of your generation hardly see this kind of transmission lines anymore. You probably haven't seen the Yagui Uda antenna, but if you are of my age, these antennas adorn the roof of many homes in America and all over the world. Okay, but not anymore because we have uh, microwave communications these days, and we use a different modality for communication, okay? So I like to emphasize that there are actually uh, three kinds of physics that emerge from Maxwell's equations. One physics is circuit physics. That is when the wavelength is very, very long compared to the structure. I think we went through the lecture on circuit theory so when the structure of something is very short compared to wavelengths, you can say that you can apply circuit theory. And this happens inside the computer chip. So if you look inside the computer chip, you, call, you see these uh, signal lines. They are called X and Y lines, okay? And you can essentially use circuits, like you might model this with an inductor, and then you will model the capacitive coupling between them with a capacitor and maybe if you have some imperfect conductors, you will use some resistors to model them. So you can use circuit theory to model these things quite easily. However, when the frequency goes up, like when it goes up to this uh, range where the wavelength is on the order of the antenna structure, for instance, then you're dealing with the regime of wave physics and you have to understand the wave nature of electromagnetic field before you can understand the physics behind this antenna. And here is a simulation done by my student uh, many years ago, okay, maybe 10, 20 years ago, of this Yagi Uda antenna below here. You can see that the wave has been guided. Okay, the wave has been guided. 
in the forward direction, but it's more or less been reflected by this uh, reflector in the back. And you actually cannot answer a lot of questions you ask because wave physics is difficult to understand. So you have to do quite a bit of computer simulations using commercial software. Um, the good thing about this thing is that because of nanofabrication, we can make antennas to be very small. You know that uh, optical wavelengths is about 500 nanometers. So if you want to make a half wave dipole in the optical regime, you would have to make something really, really small. And because of the advancement in nanofabrication, uh, we are able to make antennas in the optical regime. And those are known as nano antennas. And then there's another regime where the wavelength is much shorter than the structure you are investigating. Then you can essentially think of this as being optical rays. You will understand this later on uh, if you study high frequency approximations. In that regime, you can use another kind of very simple physics to understand something uh, as to how electromagnetic field interact with the structure. So there are two regimes which are simple, circuit theory and then ray theory. And then something that is in between, the two that makes it very difficult to use uh, intuition to understand. You cannot describe this with simple theory, but you have to solve Maxwell's equations in their full glory in order to understand this. So with this understanding in mind, let's talk about heuristics. And there is quite a bit of uh, concept of resonance tunneling. So what you have is that uh, when a structure resonates, it helps with the radiation performance of the structure. And we have seen this kind of resonance tunneling before in say the fabry perot resonator. Okay, it was just nothing but a very simple slab, an optical slab. And if you try to sign, uh, send light through this slab, which is something made of glass, for instance, you'll find that uh, the transmission has certain peaks uh, as the light go through this structure is because of constructive interference effect. Constructive interference, which you can also think of resonance tunneling. I think all of you know how to solve this problem in closed form now. So you'll find that at certain frequencies, uh, the denominator of the transmission line or reflection coefficient uh, goes to zero. And when that happens, you actually have a kind of a resonance. You can show like, uh, as we said before, the generalized reflection coefficient of this structure is something like R01 uh, plus R12 e to the 2i something, and then 1 minus R10 R12 e to the something. Uh, that formula we have learned before called the generalized reflection coefficient. And when the denominator of this reflection coefficient goes to zero, we say we hit the resonance. And when you hit the resonance, the reflection coefficient goes up. Uh, you also can see that the transmission coefficient will go up because transmission coefficient will have a similar mathematical structure. And you can see that this is due to resonance tunneling. So resonance enhancement allows a certain phenomenon to emerge more prominently. And this is in the case of a cavity back slot antenna where you have a cavity and you have a very small antenna if you have that small antenna alone, uh, it doesn't radiate well. So if you put this antenna outside, it's a very short dipole. Short dipoles do not radiate well as you can see, you have seen in your homework. Their radiation resistance are not that great. Um, so in order to make this antenna radiate better, you put it inside a cavity. And when you operate near the resonance frequency of this cavity, What happens is very much like what you see in the park 
the swing in the park. Okay. It's probably something that is close to everyday life experience they have encountered in resonance tunneling before. If you were to sit on the swing, and if you know how to pump the swing at its resonance frequency, the amplitude of swinging becomes bigger and bigger. And finally, uh, you can even hurt yourself if you're not too careful, if the swing swings too much. And similarly, if you put a dipole source inside this cavity, and if you operate near the resonance frequency of the cavity, is that very strong field would uh, build up inside this cavity because you have a very strong fields inside this cavity. If you open the slot on the side of this antenna, uh, you can see that the slot starts to radiate and radiates quite efficiently because of the strong field inside, you will have a strong field due to resonance tunneling. Uh, when you look at the slot antenna, uh, engineers like to explain its radiation this way. If you have an electric current, the magnetic field curves around an electric current in this manner. Okay? However, if you have a magnetic current, the duality principle should apply. And what you have then is that um, you have electric field curling around the magnetic current now. So if you see the side of the slots, you will have quite a bit of charge build up at this slot. So the electric field will look something like this because of charge build up at the slot. And hence you can think of a slot antenna as being like a magnetic dipole, a magnetic current uh, being impressed on the side of this cavity wall. And that magnetic dipole is producing electric fields that radiate, okay? So you can think of the slot antenna as being due to radiation by a magnetic current source or magnetic dipole. Because we do a quite a bit of uh, using pipes and so on and cavities in microwave engineering, you call those uh, engineers plumbers because they actually have to do quite a bit of plumbing. Another structure that you can understand heuristically, which is also due to resonance tunneling, is a microstrip patch antenna. Uh, it works approximately like this, that you have a patch antenna. You can think of this patch antenna as being like a transmission line. This is the top part of the transmission line this is the bottom part of the transmission line. And hence, if you drive it with the current, the current would go back and forth. And there would be a traveling wave that travels back and forth between these two sections of the transmission line. Since current is not allowed to flow freely at this end, you can think of this end as being an open circuit. The other end, you can also think of it as being an open circuit. So approximately, you can think of this being a transmission line with open circuits at both ends. In order for this transmission line to resonate, you very much know that if the current goes to zero at the both end, then this thing would resonate when its structure is about half a wavelength. Okay, you can find its resonance frequency quite easily just by eyeballing the current distribution. Hence the size of this antenna has to be about half a wavelength. And it's quite easy to achieve this in microwave engineering. As I said before, in microwave engineering, 10 gigahertz is three centimeters. So half a wavelength is 1.5 centimeters, which is not difficult to achieve. Moreover, you can have a dielectric constant in this medium and then the lambda, uh, effective will be the lambda of free space divided by the square root of the dielectric constant. You can easily convince yourself that if you have a wave inside a homogeneous medium, the wavelength actually becomes shorter if the dielectric constant is higher. So you can make very small structures quite easily in microwave. 
So the micro strip patch antenna is a very popular antenna for microwave engineering. And people are very creative. So they come up with designs like this, where you cut a slot, a notch on the side so that you don't fit the antenna directly. Uh, if you don't fit the antenna directly, when you fit it from a notch from the left, you can see that the current would have to follow a longer path. Okay, before it can slosh back. In the previous antenna, the current just slosh, uh, just sloshes back and forth between the two ends. But now the current just sloshes back and forth between the two ends. But the two ends are quite far apart now because this is a starting point. The current goes like this. And the current essentially goes like this and then back like this and back. And so there's a longer current path length for the current to go back and forth. Because of the longer path length, this structure would resonate at a lower frequency. And the lower frequency means that for a given frequency, you can make this structure to be smaller than this structure. Okay, you can think about it. Maybe it doesn't ring a bell right now, but if this path length is longer, uh, it will resonate at a lower frequency, which means that you can make this structure to be smaller than above structure. And you can still use a concept of resonance tunneling to enhance its radiation efficiency when it resonates. So are there any questions before I move on to the next antenna? So we're going to use heuristics to understand things now. Uh, the next antenna I like to describe to you is the horn antenna. It's a flared horn. You can see that the horns are flared. So why do we need to flare the horn? Uh, it is quite easy to understand from the concept of impedance matching. Say if you have a two transmission lines connected such as this one over on the right hand side, you want to match Z0 to Z1. You have to put the matching network in between. And in order for this matching network to work, so that there's no reflection as the wave comes in here, you pick Zn to be the square root of Z0 times Z1. I think you did this as a take home exam. Uh, so which means that uh, if you pick this Zn, which is some geometric means of Z0 and Z1, there's a name for this mean, I think it's called geometric means, okay? So we know that the wave impedance of free space is about 377 ohms, okay? You have something like 377 ohms on one side. And then here you will have waveguide microwave engineering. Usually we work around 50 ohms in microwave engineering. So in order to match the two impedances, you will put something in between that is intermediate between the two impedances. Uh, you gradually, change the impedance so that the wave can travel comfortably from this end to the other end without suffering reflection, just like over here. Here is very simple because we only have one section and it only operates at one frequency, okay? But here you might want to operate this antenna over a wider band of frequencies and hence you flare it gradually. And these are different designs of horn antennas. And here is the corrugated horn antenna. We call this the corrugated horn. Okay, we call this the corrugated horn. Um, the reason why it's corrugated is because you probably learned from your waveguide theory section that if you have corrugations in a circular waveguide, it enhances the TE10 mode. The TE10 mode is axially symmetric. And when you have an axially symmetric mode uh, propagating out there, uh, then the radiation pattern is also axially symmetric. That's why we want to enhance this uh, TE10 mode of the uh, horn antenna so as to arrive at the radiation pattern that is. Um, 
circularly or cylindrically symmetric. Okay. Yeah, sorry, it's a TE01 mode, not the TE10 mode. It's TE01 mode. So if you excite the TE01 mode in the circular waveguide, that mode is actually symmetric. And that mode can be enhanced or excited by having corrugation that uh, encourages circumferential current flow but not axial current flow. And it will try to mitigate the other modes, okay? So this is the um, corrugated horn antenna. And let's go to other kinds of clever designs that people have come up with using heuristics. And another antenna that other people have come up with is called a Vivardi antenna. Vivardi antenna is invented by Paul, uh, Paul Gibson. Uh, it was not invented by the musician uh, Vivardi. Uh, he just likes these musicians so much that he names this antenna after Vivardi. Okay, I believe it's invented around the 1960s. Uh, so you can think of a bicone antenna or the flare antenna that we talked about before, that if you flare a uh, transmission line, you can allow for the matching of the impedance of microwave engineering, which is usually around 50 ohms, to that of free space, which is around 377 ohms. So if you have something like a, a notch antenna, usually this notch is actually spelled with the ED at the end, okay? flat horn antenna, you can see that the impedance is gradually been matched from the microwave engineering side to the free space side by using this flare horn. And the flare horn is good because it uses a very little metal. Unlike the other horn antennas that you have, you have to do quite a bit of plumbing and actually make this thing massive so that they're heavy, but the floor, flare antenna can be made out of a very thin metal plate. Another good thing about the flare horn antenna is that uh, it actually gradually flares. It becomes wider and wider, which means that when the high frequency wave is leaving this antenna, they ride on this part of this horn because their wavelengths are very short. However, uh, the longer wavelengths that leaves the source will have to write on this part of the horn antenna because the gap here is bigger. So the horn antenna is also broadband in the sense that uh, it allows wavelengths of different sizes to emerge from this antenna uh, in a very comfortable fashion so that you can get radiation over a broader bandwidth. Okay, so are there any questions so far? If not, then I'd like to go on to another kind of antenna, which is the reflector antenna. Uh, this antenna is actually motivated by ray optics. And hence they are good in two regimes, either when the wavelength is very short, as we have in optical wavelengths, or when the size of the structure is large compared to wavelength, the two are synonymous, okay? Uh, so one thing you notice in electromagnetics is that the yardstick that you have is the wavelength. What is small, what is large in electromagnetics, you use the wavelength as the gauge, okay? So if I make this structure that you see in the picture around say, uh, 10 gigahertz, usually they might even operate at a higher frequency than that. 10 gigahertz, the wavelength is three centimeters. It's not as short as that of the optical wavelengths, but if I make my structure very large compared to the wavelength of the electromagnetic field, then the wave would treat this structure as if it is in the optical regime. So we say that these are quasi optical concepts that we use. Okay, and 
the good thing about this is that this antenna has very high directivity because you can see that uh, you can drive this antenna from the back. This is called a Casa Green design. You send the signals from the back and they all become collimated in the far field. And because they are collimated, they give rise to very high directivity. So the directive gain function will look something like this because of the construction of this design. And one thing that you want to understand is that when the wavelength is very short compared to the structure, you can essentially think of the fact that you can make a local plane wave approximation. Okay, you can think of a local plane wave approximation. And then you can think of something called local plane, uh, local phase matching. Let me write out phase properly. So if the wave comes in, it will have a phase as it propagates. And then the transmitted wave will be in this direction. And then the reflected wave will be in this direction. You can think of them as all locally plane wave and their phases have to match with each other around this vicinity when the wave comes in. And hence you can think because of this reason, you have Snell's law and you have incidence law of reflection, transmission law of reflection being usable when the wavelength is very short. So you can actually use quasi optical concepts uh, to design this kind of antenna. We have talked about this in the context of lens that in the regime of uh, very short wavelengths, you can use uh, lens optics to understand things. And of course, uh, if you are into radio astronomy, you want to make the antenna as big as possible so that the effective aperture is large, you probably have learned about this concept of effective aperture. So you like to make the effective aperture of the antenna as large as possible. Uh, so they have built two such kinds of antenna around the world. One is the one as Arashibo, which is uh, somewhere in, in the south of America. Um, and then the other one is in China. This is called a FAST. Okay, this is, this is Arashibo is in Puerto Rico. Okay. And, and you can see that the one in China is brand new. The one in Arashibo is kind of uh, born because of age. Okay. Uh, so they are all used to study uh, radio astronomy, looking for outer signals from the outside world and maybe to look for SETI. SETI stands for, uh, I don't know, something like Society for Extraterrestrial Intelligence something like that, okay? To detect uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. I don't know what S stands for, it may stand for society. And then you can have uh, other kinds of quasi optical concepts where you can make a surface that uh, reflect the ray, the light in such a way, we call this uh, reflector ray and it is very difficult to solve problems of this kind because you don't have closed form solution. It uses the fact that if you have uh, different kinds of uh, distances between the two parts of the lens, this lens can be used to focus light. And then it involves in the concepts of Fresnel lens, which some of you might know about before, where you, instead of building a very thick lens, you build a Fresnel lens that is thinner, and this has been also used in optics. But what is more important is that you can make this thing entirely flat by using different kinds of metal coating on a flat surface, causing the light to 
reflect and diffract differently. Uh, this is called a meta surface. And you can use that to focus uh, the electromagnetic wave uh, using commercial software simulation. You cannot solve this problem in closed form, but then you can use commercial software. And then there are the other kinds of uh, quasi optical structures like uh, lens antennas and so on. And then they make artificial dielectrics by putting metal structures or mixing materials of different uh, permittivity and conductivity. Together, you get an effective medium. And with an effective medium, you can make lenses of all types. Uh, and then maybe you can embed some of this into the plastics that you have. Uh, another thing I like to talk about is actually small antenna. So you like the antennas to become as small as possible, but you also like to have this antenna resonate so that resonance tunneling can come into effect and this antenna will be a good radiator. You can see very easily that you can make a small resonator of a quarter wavelength uh, in this manner. A quarter wavelength resonator is of course better than a half wavelength resonator or even better than a full wavelength resonator because of its small size. Small size is very important in cell phone antenna design because you want the antenna to fit into your cell phone and the cell phone can fit into your pocket. Okay, So PFAR, which stands for planar inverted F antenna, because it looks like an F, you can look at it, it looks like an F, an inverted F antenna. Uh, then you can change the driving impedance of this antenna by moving this driving point uh, back and forth. When it's very close to the short, uh, its driving impedance is very low. And then when you move it away from the short and close to the open circuit, its driving point impedance can be made large. So it allows you to engineer this antenna with different uh, driving point impedance. And of course, people are clever. They come up with a U-slot antenna. Essentially, this U-slot antenna allows you to cause the current to have a torture path. Now, if you feed this with the current, the current will have to go like this, like this, sloshes back and forth like this. And this U-slot antenna is smaller than a ordinary uh, antenna. This is one idea for miniaturization. And then many years ago, I used to work uh, for General Motors to help them simulate antennas on top of a car. And it's quite a difficult thing to do, but we were able to do that with a team of uh, research scientists and students working together. And here is another example of where you can see simulations. I think I've shown, seen this before. Essentially, the electromagnetic field has to tear off from the source before it can radiate, okay? And then at one time I was working with uh, a group of researchers at the University of Hong Kong to design RFID tags. RFID tags are something that can pick up electromagnetic signals and they can communicate with a small CPU inside this tag and then send signals back to you. That essentially is how your credit card work and how your ID card work. But this one is more sophisticated than that. And here is how you can design a small loop antenna, okay, using uh, inductive and capacitive loading. I will not go into detail with this. And then here is an example of by using capacitive loading of this loop antenna, you can make the loop smaller or make it resonate uh, at the lower frequency, okay? And so you can do a lot of things with uh, computer simulation. Okay, I am running out of time. I actually talk about this all heuristically. I have more detailed descriptions of them in the lecture notes. You can read the lecture notes and if you're interested in doing any of these projects, uh, let me know. I think there are plenty of things you can do with computer simulation software these days due to the advancement we have made in computational electromagnetics. Are there any questions before I let you go and, and before we stop here? Any questions?
Okay, if not, then I'll let you go and see you Friday then. Thank you, Professor. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming. It's always nice to have you. This is kind of... Uh, kind of bad having to lecture to a small class. But nice seeing you and see you Friday. <laughs>